go ahead and very slowly bring us to a start. Um, I know we'll have a number of people joining us and a number of people listening to the recording after the fact. Uh, my name, I should introduce myself first. My name is Marieta Bozovic. I'm an assistant professor here at Yale in the Slavic department, affiliated also with film and media studies and women, gender and sexuality studies. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce both a speaker and a, a series, an entire series. This is our very first event in the Emerging Voices Virtual Colloquium Series, uh, a new initiative in RIS, the program in, Re in Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at the Yale Macmillan Center. Um, it is very much my hope that this series can become uh, a permanent thing in one format or another, even after this very unusual year of intellectual programming. Uh, f f first and foremost, credit to starting this series should go to Professor of Anthropology and our fearless leader in Reese, Doug Rogers, but also to my partners in organizing crime, uh, Ginny Chu, Mina Magda, Spencer Small, as well as Christina Andriotis, Asia New Payne, and today uh, Kathleen Kifa, who are making this possible. Um, and uh, I'll say a few things about the format of the talk before introducing and handing the floor over to our speaker. Um, we have about an hour. Um, uh, we will hear Daniel Lederman's talk. Uh, I will continue to, to host and to uh, give discussion remarks, mostly structured as a series of questions, as well as then start to pull in questions from the audience. And we would ask you to send us your questions via the Q&A function rather than chat. Um, so without further ado then, um, I will introduce Daniel Lederman. Uh, who will be speaking to us about Enduring Utopia, Eastern Europe in Video Games. Daniel Lederman teaches art history and game studies at the Department of Visualization at Texas A&M University. In 2016, Daniel defended a PhD dissertation entitled Moscow Conceptualism and Shimmering, Authority, Anarchism and Space at the Department of Art and Archaeology in Princeton University. That project investigates the Moscow conceptualists, a circle of experimental artists and writers that emerged in Moscow's unofficial artistic scene in the early 1970s in the context of nonconformism, tracing their development of the critical strategy called shimmering and its relationship to contemporary post-Soviet and post-Crimean artistic resistance. Most recently, Daniel has been working on a book under contract with Amherst College Press and on the representation of utopian and dystopian projects through images of Eastern Europe in contemporary video games, which is what he will be speaking to us about today. Uh, join me in giving a very warm welcome to Daniel. Thank you so much, Dr. Brzovic, and thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here to Reese and to Yale University. Um, I'm very excited to share my work with you today. Um, so, let me share my screen and begin my PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, my talk is going to be entitled Enduring Utopia, Eastern Europe and Video Games. And it explores a part of a larger project for looking at games as a specifically modern form and attempting to discuss how they operate um, as a territorializing discourse. So before I launch much further, I want to kind of set the theoretical grounds on which I'm talking about uh, through two quotes. The first from uh, Johan Huizinga, one of the kind of original theorists of games of the 20th century, when he defines the specific operation of games as uh, what I'm gonna call the magic circle, describing games as having a particular function where they draw themselves or draw a circle around an area of the world, declaring it to be then a separate world bound by separate rules and uh, able to test separate kinds of behaviors, uh, uh, you know, cultural forms, or even broader things like societies. Now, for Kuzinga and Homo Ludens, one of the strangest arguments he in a sense makes in that book is that uh, games aren't just a subset of culture. Culture is a kind of subset of games. The culture operates through this ludic model of uh, drawing a circle and entrapping a part of the world and declaring it uh, different. And that's why he lists all these various other aspects from the temple uh, to the arena to the court of law. The other big quote I'm working with comes from Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, Schizophrenia and Capitalism, 
uh, where they describe the process of territorialization. And they do this throughout the book, but the quote that I chose for our purposes is one that describes this particular relationship between territorialization and territory, which is to say that uh, territorialization uh, um, produces territory, that it's not as if the territory is primary and it's merely explored or described, is that these processes of making uh, territory, which for Deleuze and Guattari include all sorts of processes from uh, the kind of ideas of the family to enlightenment uh, models of science and uh, kind of geography to politics, to war, to everything else under the sun, uh, to them, all of them involve a kind of making of territory through territorialization. And in a sense, in my project, I kind of merge these two, merge these two through the idea of the magic circle as this kind of drawing a line around a piece of the world calling it separate from the world, but in the process doing what all magic circles do, working a kind of magic upon the world outside of it. In a sense, draw, creating a uh, territory to manipulate the rest of the world and of games as an art form that is specifically focused on this process and focused on it for a very long time. Indeed, I kind of look at games from a very early point, like for example, this map of tenderness from 1654 from uh, Madeleine de Scudery's novel Clélie, uh, which is, presents a kind of ludic object, right? These kinds of maps were almost role-playing games for couples to play through, showing different routes to affection, one uh, kind of more direct and head-on, one more kind of reticent, uh, one leading to uh, the lake of indifference, one leading to the uh, sea of uh, uh, animosity, uh, right? To suggest a kind of a ludic exploration of the soul of romance, of spirituality, that suggests to us that games from a very early point were trying to territor uh, territorialize very vast domains, not just expected things like childhood or, for example, fate with gambling, but also a complicated emotions, spiritual ambitions, and various other projects. Uh, for example, colonialism, children's games from a very early point became kind of vehicles for colonial enterprise, such as, for example, the game of Germany's colonies, which has been uh, written about fairly well, which suggests suggest that for the child, a journey to adulthood is a journey to conquer the whole world, turning all of its citizens into these sorts of colonized, uh, either colonized or threatening bodies, uh, which is again repeated exactly on the cover where a kind of su supremely racist image of the uh, child becoming adult, right, manifesting a mustache and a kind of adult uh, control over the world through the course of subjugating racial others. So in other words, games have been carrying very weighty ideological loads for quite some time. And rather than capturing small territories, have been capturing very large territories indeed for many centuries to come. This has become normalized in many ways by uh, the kind of comfortable role of territorialization in the medium. For example, if you look at things like uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, one of the most influential moralizing novels uh, of the last couple of, uh, of centuries, it began with a kind of ludic map similar to a map of the heart, allowing people to territorialize their own journey to heaven. But by the end of the 19th century, it's turned into a racetrack board game familiar to us like anything, any other one, like, a, a, you know, a Candyland or any other, um, which captures the same spiritual domain and readily offers it as territorializable and capturable to their audience. So this is a bigger part of my project. And what I want to zoom in on today is what happens with very, very contemporary ideologies, with the role of representation of capitalism, socialism, the post-Soviet world in modern games, with all of this kind of uh, legacy of territorialization and magic circling in mind. And specifically, when we look at a capitalist world, uh, games today have gotten to the point where these modes of uh, embodying capitalist discourse, naturalizing it, turning it into almost kind of a trope of itself, uh, have become very, very familiar. And here's examples of two, some of the most famous and influential franchises for depicting a capitalism in action. Uh, City Skylines, which allows you to kind of build cities, building on the legacy started by SimCity back at the end of the 1980s, uh, which operates uh, quite simply. Uh, you, in a sense, have a pool of money. You designate certain areas within the game as for residential areas or for uh, economic areas. And those areas just start sprouting businesses and houses. You always seem to need more roads to connect them, right? It's the magic hand of capitalism operating on its own. All you need to do is sort of designate and the city will start to produce itself, turning ever more uh, visually spectacular as it grows. Uh, conversely, civilization shows us the other side of territorialization and colonialism as entangled discourses, where the entire process of becoming civilized from colonization, from a, a cave people to uh, the space race, is a process of capturing more and more land, developing that land more and more, uh, using those developments to produce more troops to capture more land, and in a sense, producing a kind of colonial war machine every time. Uh, and in a sense, calling that civilization. 
right? So these are the most stable kinds of representing capitalism. And they have been well criticized in the press uh, and various interesting projects. For example, uh, Do Not Eat, a series of Skype uh, of YouTube videos called uh, uh, City Skylines Power, Politics and Planning, uh, where uh, uh, Do Not Eat Please, uh, City Skylines, uh, as a kind of ongoing critique of capitalist uh, urban capture. For example, in episode two, he builds a highway, uh, clicking and erasing buildings one at a time, while providing a kind of role-played or imaginative narration of whose lives he's destroying. For example, uh, a small land, small town landlord, uh, right, whose building is marked right there for deletion to be replaced by a highway, a video that uses the game to comment on uh, issues in capitalism. But today I wanna to turn away from capitalism and the representation of capitalism, rather to games by East European developers that seem to represent a post-Soviet landscape specifically. And the first one I want to look at is Workers and Resources Soviet Republic, which only came out in 2019, a Slovakian game from 3D Vision, uh, which charges you with building a city much in the way of city skylines and with a lot of familiar devices, but one that is recognizably a Soviet Republic. And indeed you pick the decade you start, 60s, 70s or 80s, um, and it comes with appropriate architecture and machinery. Uh, your city is always situated on a kind of geographically empty map marked only by uh, a Western and uh, Soviet border uh, with which you can conduct various kinds of trades. But ultimately, unlike games like City Skylines, the game resists your every effort to turn the terrain into a kind of uh, site for your uh, utopian fantasy. Because unlike City Skylines, which does all the work for you, and as I said, just marks the territory and populates it with little, little sprouting buildings, uh, workers and resources ask that you manage every step of the process yourself. If, the build, if you want to build a building, you need cement. If you want cement, you need gravel. If you want gravel, you need a gravel plant. If you want a gravel plant, you need apartments close to that, a gravel plant and bus routes and other vehicles. And you have to take care of every individual part of it yourself. Indeed, if you look at a window, uh, for example, this is one tab for one building within workers and resources, letting you see what it looks like when you try to make any decisions. You have to pick the right bus from the right era and they're all very well researched and accurate. Um, and of course you can filter it, but you can see that it's not just buses, everything from personal cars to pavers, cranes, sewing machines, dumpers, oil tanks, and so on and so forth are available for your perusal, very closely researched, and in a sense put you in a position where if you want to build socialism, it won't magically build itself for you, but on the contrary, it will repeatedly fail, fail on you because you're not good enough at the game, because you don't know anything about, uh, you know, the differences between Chaff B13 and the IKR 280. And until you figure it out by playing the game through excruciating difficulty, uh, reading all the manuals, getting really, really good at it, your socialism will always fail. You will never build utopia. But if you get good at it, you might. Let's take a look at another game. Uh, the Polish studio, 11-bit studios Frostpunk, uh, was an ambitious example for the studio, which had previously only made kind of avant-garde indie games like this War of Mine, which simulated surviving the siege of Sarajevo uh, by a group of unarmed and vulnerable survivors. Frostpunk takes it to a bit, a bit of a different, different direction. In Frostpunk, you are surviving a climate catastrophe, which has plunged the earth into a permanent winter, uh, seemingly at the midst of a kind of a, a late 19th century technological boom. Uh, there are strict class divisions and continuous problems surrounding it as manifest in various scenarios. For example, having to keep a large populated city alive, having to keep a scientific community alive, or in the case of the images I'm showing above, uh, having to keep a community uh, of workers who discovered that the rich were planning to build these sorts of uh, mobile uh, clay, uh, sorry, not clay, uh, coal burning uh, stations, uh, stole one such station, rebelled, and are trying to run a kind of communist project. And once again, the terrain itself is not a source of fantasy realization. It's not like Minecraft or SimCity or any of the uh, kind of capitalist Western games that present land as just an endless source of bountyhood for the realization of your fantasies. Rather, it's getting colder every day, the situation becomes worse every day, and uh, your progress, such as it is, is not towards an utopian, beautiful capitalist city, but towards a kind of hard scrabble existence, which is always depleting all the resources around it and making itself more difficult. The more houses you build, the more heat you need, the more coal you need, the more houses you need. You're never ever able to satisfy your people and the society is always collapsing either into a problems of discontent or a loss of hope. Indeed, unlike most such games, which typically have what we call a tech tree or gradual progress, like in Civilization, where you started in the cave era and worked your way up uh, to rocket science, suggesting that there's always a teleology of progress and improvement in human society. In Frostpunk, this whole idea is completely broken down and reversed. Frostpunk makes a compelling argument against progress by having virtually every development of your sciences be of worsening of life for the people in your civilization. One of the first developments, for example, is around child labor. 
Do you want to put children into safe jobs or these sorts of protected child shelters, which can later be leveraged to some kind of medical or scientific education? where safe jobs can be leveraged into all jobs, which leads to sending your children to fill the much needed holes in your workforce as your uh, sprawling city trying to survive this climate apocalypse keeps growing. And indeed, virtually all such scientific developments make things worse. You're always learning how to add sawdust to food or in a much more advanced part of the tech tree later, uh, create either a theocratic uh, uh, nightmare society uh, with human sacrifices or an autocratic uh, dystopian state uh, which where you are the figure figurehead leader. Uh, in both cases, the technological progress leads to nothing good. And the sense the game tests you and tests your skill as a player by telling you maybe you should stop researching new technologies. Maybe you should try to survive with your society uh, as utopian, meaningly unmanaged and uninvolved with all these discoveries as you can. And once again, this utopian seems to manifest in the landscape's resistance to you. Uh, in which the game keeps reminding you about by pushing against your decisions. For example, if you do put children to work, there will be uh, accidents and kind of moments to decide whether or not you want to ban child labor, put children on safer labor, or proceed with your uh, kind of a, a Taylorist experiment at survival for the sake of survival. One of the most ambitious games that dealt with the landscape in a peculiar way uh, was uh, Studio Zalms, and Studio Zalms is, a, is an Estonian avant-garde art studio, uh, Disco Elysium, a project which kind of combined a whole variety of ambitious ideas uh, and has garnered a number of awards uh, last year when it came out. Uh, a project that puts you in the shoes of a kind of a Venichka Yerofeyev in Moscow Petrushki slash bad lieutenant as figure, uh, a alcoholic policeman who wakes up from a drunken binge, having forgotten everything, uh, and putting you in the position of having to learn it all again, uh, while trying to ostensibly solve a murder, uh, specifically what seems to be a lynching, um, uh, while uh, dealing with a variety of complicated thoughts in her voices and ideologies, as the major setting is captured by ideological struggles. The setting of the city is one uh, of city of Revanchal, which has been taken over by a communist revolution, which succeeded and then was crushed by the neoliberal forces of the world, uh, leading a kind of ruined economic substate where uh, all the various ideologies of the world are endlessly struggling against one another in the wake of a looming climate catastrophe. A big portion of the game is again caught up with its own landscape, which is what I want to focus on here today. Revan Charles landscape is a highly developed one and one loaded with symbolic imagery. For example, the city center is caught up by the statue of the uh, executed king, which was overthrown by the communist revolution, uh, which was uh, whose uh, horseback statue was dynamited by the communards and then reassembled by a Dadaist collective within the game uh, in the moment of explosion, as it's preserved as if always already exploding, never fully falling apart a kind of continuous metaphor for a revolution suspended endlessly as an unending ruin, which just goes nowhere and yet preserves both the utopianism uh, of the revolutionary gesture of exploding it, the failure of that utopianism, and the possibility of reviewing that failure as a kind of crucial metaphor. The same is true of the role of the church in Disco Elysium, acting as the only kind of site of spirituality. The church is abandoned and taken over by a musical collective which give you a completely irrelevant side quest while you're solving a murder in this dour world. Hoping this musical collective uh, set up a show seems completely off uh, character and yet proves to be kind of an important turn, an important part of the rhetoric in the game uh, as it weaves in the larger story of the apocalypse. You discover that the world is dying due to kind of a crisis of memory, what is called the pale, which seems to eat away whole continents simply by, by weight of existing and may or may not be produced by humanity somehow, but is used to make alcohol, which we also learn. Uh, which is somehow gnawing a hole in reality at the center of this church, creating interesting musical distortions, which you learn in the course of this concert. This metaphor for having a musical concert in the midst of an apocalypse, an apocalypse that directly connects to a kind of cultural amnesia, marks it a connection to the character themselves, who have forgotten all of the world due to the weight of politics, memory, ideology, trauma, and the various uh, kind of embeddedments of these traumas within the landscape. Repeatedly, as you explore the city, its memory pops up. For example, seeing the executed commune arts pop up at the docks by the bullet holes they've left behind, marked by your character's exploration as a detective. So in other words, the landscape here carries its own utopianism as a kind of persistent scarring, a scarring that is marked in it, contained in it, and still presents itself as a form of resistance. You have to kind of dig it out, discover it like a, a detective, like a Sherlock Holmes, which in some ways in the game you are, by digging into it repeatedly. And perhaps the most kind of iconic game within this subgenre is one that came before all of these games and created its own little uh, cult following uh, back in 2005, Ice Pick Lodge's Mor Utopia or Pathologic, 
uh, which has recently been remade, at least one chapter of it, uh, the central characters chapter was remade last year uh, in a kind of limited release, but which puts us in a very familiar position, that of a uh, plague taking over a city and putting everyone under quarantine. And you as one of three doctors or faith healers or uh, medics of various kinds trying to uh, resolve it or cure the people within the city while uh, figuring out what's causing the plague in the first place. And as you explore, once again, the terrain becomes the major character. Uh, for the city, uh, which is never named, but seems to be kind of a city out of a Dostoevsky novel from the late 19th, or, or a novel from the late 19th century, uh, is one that is uh, labyrinthine and which forces you to run throughout it back and forth between its major landmarks for much of the game, leading you confused and out of time, for the game also times you and makes, makes your uh, movements limited while demanding that you survive and eat and uh, find food. And uh, at least when I made my students play it, uh, they had a very, very rough time of it. It is absolutely brutal and unforgiving. It's the kind of game where the game gives you a weapon and you need to weapon in that game, but then you most likely are gonna sell it to get some bread because you're gonna starve before uh, you run out of uh, opportunities to use your weapon. So it's it's absolutely brutal. And it's the brutality is caught up in this landscape, which is littered with utopian architecture, right? These buildings that seem to have no purpose and no, are impossible physically. And at some point you begin to realize that this utopian architecture is a central metaphor in the game. Indeed, the whole city is a kind of uh, meta metaphor itself caught up in both the living body of the city and the utopia successfully realized and built within it, which you can see on the left of the screen, the so-called Nogagrannik uh, uh, or uh, uh, polygon, um, which is revealed to you at some point mid game to be uh, a literal injury, a kind of ins insertion into the living body of the city bull um, and which manifests as this massive tower on the outskirts of town, which holds a true utopia. Namely, it's a state of permanence and immortality populated by children uh, who have their own counsel and have an important function in the game that I won't discuss at length. So the choice in the game is always torn between the three characters where the bachelor attempts to rescue the utopia and the immortality it represents, the high respects attempts to rescue the city and the life it represents, and uh, the changeling uh, or uh, imposterous uh, realizes the, the whole thing is a, is a genre convention. That's not really important for us. For me, and I'm sorry, there's a train coming and it's going to make a lot of loud noises for a second. I live right by a railroad. For me, what's crucial here is that this kind of sums up for us the issue that we're facing with these games. Eastern Europe itself acts as a kind of stand-in for a terrain which is simultaneously unbearable to endure. And in being unbearable to endure, a perfect testing ground for utopias uh, blossom and fail, where you can play around with utopias and somehow know them to be legitimate. In other words, if my original thesis was that games always territorialize, my development of it is that East European games use territory as a kind of sandbox for utopian historical experimentation. They produce an Eastern Europe or imagine an Eastern Europe that's designed for utopian historical experimentation. Two, it's that the weight of historical memory is embodied as a kind of traumatized or traumatizing landscape. That in these games, the landscape itself is what speaks this kind of particular history of utopian experimentation gone wrong or turned dystopian. And there are numerous other examples that I explore elsewhere. I just wanted to focus on these here. But all of these games present this unstructured opportunities for finding hope in precarity and difficulty. These games are brutal and you most likely will lose them, even if you're an experienced gamer and are trying to play them, you know, knowing how to play video games very well. But the fact that you can't potentially win them or can get really good at them, you know, really learn workers and resources and which are the optimal trolley buses, means that they suggest that it's possible to one day build utopia. They open up this window for hope precisely through difficulty and precarity rather than creating a kind of blithe screen for ideology, the way games like uh, City Skylines. Um, and finally, in a kind of weird way, they turn on to not just criticisms of utopian discourse, right? Not just condemnations of uh, the failure of the Soviet utopia or of the post-Soviet world as one perpetually marked by the failure of the Soviet utopia, but attempts to kind of practice it, to replay it, uh, to frame it with an unendurable difficulty and frame that difficulty itself as a kind of moral accomplishment, sort of quest, right? This is really apparent in Frostpunk, where as I said, you know, if you wanna be really truly moral, you just stop pursuing progress and stop the game in its tracks and no, you know, don't research child labor and don't research putting sawdust into food. Uh, but in all of these games, this kind of limitation, a structured limitation of playing against the grain of the game is almost designed in, right? In, in a Disco Elysium, for example, it's not abusing drugs, although drugs are really useful and helpful throughout the game. 
choosing not to abuse them really puts you on a different track uh, uh, story-wise. So that's really what I wanted to discuss. And this is kind of the big emphasis in my work right now. And I'm really interested in hearing uh, what questions the, uh, the audience has and what questions Dr. Bajovic has presented uh, in response. And thank you once again so much for the opportunity uh, to Dr. Bajovic and to Reeves. Thank you so much. I'll unmute myself and clap um, uh, before launching launching right in with my with my questions. Um, I have many, um, and some of them will pertain uh, quite directly to your your final points. Um, so, you know, perhaps my my first and biggest overarching question is about the term utopia in your your title, um, and what seems to me the central question is whether this. Uh, utopia, whether this utopia is in quotation marks or not, um, you know, whether uh, the fragments of utopia presented in these video games um, share a similar relationship to uh, earlier avant-garde projects as, let's say, the, the kitsch of hammer and sickle hats and pins that one might find and buy in places like Prague um, uh, share to uh, federal state so socialist experiment. You know, um, uh, to, what, to what extent is this um, uh, peddling in kitsch um, uh, that actually, in fact, reminds us of these, these physical, physical artifacts that are precisely peddled in, in some of the same spaces that these video games are produced. Mm -hmm. So those are, I think, two very interesting questions. I think I'll answer them separately. On the issue of utopia, I think that utopianism as a form is something that can't conclusively be kind of quotationed or not. Um, for me, in many ways, I work with, with uh, kind of the original definition of it as a no place, and yet a no place that's sort of meticulously and weirdly described. Indeed, one of the kind of readings I do with my, with my students in, in my game history classes, have them comp I, I have them, um, I quiz them on uh, pieces from Utopia uh, and from, from Moore and uh, Dungeons and Dragons manual and tell, have them t see which ones, if they can tell them apart. And they can't, it's a, it's a kind of a trick quiz because the language and the descriptiveness is really similar. There's a similar impulse to, to games to produce these kinds of non-places as investigations of really peculiar thought forms. And so to me, part of my project is sort of to not just look at pieces of utopianism in discrete games, but to argue that games as a form, at least since the 18th century, have been profoundly utopian in their structure, in their formal ways of thinking about themselves, in the ways they position themselves as design objects, whether, you know, everything from snakes and ladders, which, which originally began as a, uh, either a Sikh or a Hindi game of the journey of the soul from birth to paradise, right? So the idea that you can take that, take the journey of the soul and put it in a, a little square board game and run through it using randomization is to me something that games have insisted on from a very early point and deals with utopianism head on. Just this idea that we can definitely take perfect, a kind of an idealized or perfected world and materialize it in this particular way. Uh, so, so to me, it's like, it's like that's, a, that's key, a key part of my argument is that that's what the magic circle in a sense is. It's about the production of utopianism. Um, and utopianism is in a sense a subset of it, much the way that, that uh, for Huizinga culture was a subset of games. But on the second side of it, as far as kitsch, first of all, I think that kitsch is a huge term here. Um, and one that, that is crucial because games are, are in a, a peculiar place of being simultaneously kind of um, incorporated into high art when they take certain gestures um, and did moments in collecting games for a while, but also not incorporated in high art in a sense disinterested with high art from a totally different angle. Um, Studio Zaun from a Disco Elysium is a good example. They were kind of a fine arts and a punk collective for about 20 years before they decided to make a, a video game. What's their relationship to high art is, is a complicated question, right? They have a number of novels that maybe wouldn't be high art either. Um, I think the kitsch is almost self-conscious in many cases, certainly uh, for, for example, workers and resources, the elaborate research done to make sure that all the trolley buses look right and the right level of kind of uh, faux nostalgia is hit, uh, uh, substitutes for a lot of other kinds of representation and uses kitsch to sort of efface a lot of uh, other issues. Say there is no politics in uh, um, uh, workers and resources. It's all very much kind of almost a Marxist structure of the world where it's all economics. People don't have anything besides desires for things like schools and playgrounds um, within walking distance or bus distance. Uh, whereas uh, for Disco Elysium, this kind of kitchification of the past is very acute and very kind of focused, but that game is much more um, uh, kind of narrative and literary and, and, and self-conscious of its own um, 
a place uh, in a post-Soviet discourse. So I think that that on the one level, um, some of these games certainly just use uh, tropes of the Soviet as pure kitsch. And actually I kind of excluded a few just because they weren't interesting and because they just did that. Um, you know, there's like a, a Soviet space game now that's basically all vodka jokes, right? Or, or things like that. Um, but there's also ones that are very self-conscious about it like the Russian made Adam RPG, uh, which is attempts to be the American kind of a, a spin-off on an American series, imagining uh, a kind of dystopian future based in the 1950s and very uh, Philip K. Dick-esque. This one imagines a kind of post-Soviet future based on a nuclear apocalypse happening in the 1980s. So they're, they're very aware of this kinds of kitschification of themselves and, and play around with them. Uh, but I think it's a broad and, and vast issue. Um, and in some ways, all games fit under the kitsch umbrella and are view themselves as a kind of pop art form. And in some ways, uh, avant-gardism blossoms within it anyway, right? From a kind of critical position, from a kind of subversive position, or from just indie studios being indie studios. Right. You know, I was really struck by by this quote from your talk, um, which I'll paraphrase as something like, your socialism will always fail unless you get really good at the game. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, which is, you know, a compelling, <laughs> compelling quote. Um, but I'm struck by the fact that, you know, what you become really good at is, let's say, you know, telling uh, knowing what number of a certain kind of train parts to buy within this, as you as you correctly describe, highly separate space of the game, which is uh, not then a skill that can be applied to something outside of the 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 game. So, what does it mean uh, to ask of the player to dedicate a certain kind of energy um, based on an imaginary um, of a political reality or a uh, imagined future, political future, but where that the skill being gained is completely useless. You know, what, what utopia is this? Yeah, I think that's, again, that's really broadly characteristic of games, them, games as a medium. Um, in pretty much every other form of, 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 of modern and, and postmodern art, difficulty has been an ongoing problem of great interest to the uh, to the critics and one often posed as the enemy of kitsch right going right back to clement greenberg's avant-garde and kitsch which, where difficulty was in a sense the rock upon which he would build his church uh with games this relationship has just collapsed um difficult games can be kitschy and kitschy games can be difficult um and the two are often not only not in, in any kind of objection to one another but sometimes the most avant-garde and weird games like pathologic get a fan following because they're difficult because video game fans consider it a sort of a, you know, a, a challenge to acquire this completely useless skill and pursue it and become the best at it, uh, or to achieve a particularly difficult ending just for the bragging rights. So it's a very difficult, different relationship than one we're familiar with with arts in general, but one that's really opportune for artists uh, to carry these kinds of heavy ideological messages. Um, and indeed, um, the kind of ludic epistemology that comes out of these objects is really fraudulent, as I said, with uh, it's always it's always fraudulent. Like I said, workers and resources, for example, doesn't exactly teach you how to manage a society. Um, and even the ones that do represent other kinds of managements will always necessarily exclude something. But this is always an epistemological problem, right? There are always things excluded from any narrative. When we discuss, for example, literature as a kind of moral pedagogy, it's a lot of things that literature, you know, also misrepresents, excludes a lot of criticisms to be made of what we might have once called, you know, moralizing literature of the 19th century, right? And uh, looking for these kinds of gaps and problems remains the task of the critic observing these objects. Uh, but their ability to make rhetoric, rhetorical arguments, both in traditional rhetorics and what Ian Bogus calls procedural rhetorics, in other words, what the game teaches you through the kind of devices I emphasize, like bus prices and, and uh, efficiency, uh, is also pretty crucial. Um, obviously, Disco Elysium is a much more complicated philosophical argument, but when we look at uh, uh, kind of more uh, simple things like the cost of food, for example, and pathologic, and the way it jumps up throughout the days and makes your life harder and harder. That's a game device, but one that uh, emphasizes particular kinds of scarcity, particular kinds of vulnerability. Um, and again, it puts you in a very different position than it would be a Western game where you don't have to, example, have to worry about eating at all. Uh, you just have to worry about blowing away enough bad guys. Right? So, so through these kinds of devices, these games do, um, emphasize certain ethical problems or uh, personal problems or vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, the, the refugee experience is really big in, uh, in uh, uh, the um, 
oh my God, Frostpunk, uh, for example, in the revolutionary narrative I set up, the upper class that you in a sense betrayed and whose who's, who's, uh, uh, um, property you've appropriated shows up eventually begging for rescue. And a lot of big part of the game is how to negotiate um, your own desire to just punish them versus the ethical obligation to at least save their kids or, or provide them with some kind of support uh, because otherwise they just die out there in the cold. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of moralization that these games built in and a lot of it is rhetorical and a lot of it is just built into the mechanics. I obviously, I don't think it's um, uh, in any ways accurate or teaches us how to be proper revolutionaries, but I think it's interesting that it's trying. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we've seen a lot of media saying, you know, here's how to, how to become, um, a, how, to build a, how to build socialism properly uh, for quite some time. And it's, it's fascinating to me that it's an effort that it's happening um, in this particularly kind of unexamined medium or even subgenre of this medium. Right, it's an interesting question, you know, to think um, uh, what is more more utopian um, in some sense, um, uh, thinking that through the practice of becoming good at a particular game, we might in fact learn something practical about uh, train parts, or if in, um, precisely the inutility of it, uh, and the fact that we can create a space where we can train in something so beautifully useless um, uh, is um, uh, the, the key part, um, or the key part of the, the joy. Um, uh, but I wanted to take us in the direction of audiences, because also in your last answer, you were talking a little bit about Western, Eastern, and um, uh, I think a question on many of our minds is, who is the imagined audience for these games? To what extent is it primarily an Eastern Europe um, as a kind of, as you put it, itself a, a ludic, a ludic space, a ludic imaginary for some Western audience, you know, Western, former West, Western, very much in, in quotation marks. Um, uh, and here I think of a uh, for example, Zizek's writing on um, cinema in the Balkans, um, and the Balkans as the unconscious of, of Europe. You know, Zizek, in his, in his typical Zizekian way, perhaps, uh, calling uh, the Balkans, but by extension, Eastern Europe, um, a particular kind of imaginary for Western Europe, um, or uh, by extension, America. Um, the audiences playing these video games, are they consumers of a similar imaginary? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess to, to respond to your comment, I kind of, again, feel two questions in there. First on the question of utility and utility, I feel that I, maybe I didn't make my point quite clear. I think that, that um, utility and utility is sort of an odd way of talking about games. One that's ideologically, historically specific to games since John Law games were continuously discussed in terms of whether or not they bring educational utility or not, um, but one that broadly affects all of the arts, right? I mean, there is no true utility to um, James Joyce's Ulysses either, right? And it requires a lot of uh, labor and intensive focus, uh, but we justify those practices under the kind of banner of art, whereas video games and games more broadly are often um, weirdly instrumentalized as if they must produce certain kinds of effects in order to ex justify their existence, right? Or justify the time spent in them. Um, and I think that with the difficulty as a, as a subset of these games, right, you can spend a lot hours and hours playing SimCity or Civilization as well, or City Skylines, rather than something more frustrating like uh, Workers and Resources. Uh, but part of the kind of role of difficulty in games is that uh, certain kinds of players will be drawn to the more difficult archetype because it's more difficult. Um, to me, what interests me is that it makes different arguments, right? So the more easier versions of those games that represent the building of capitalism as a kind of natural flow of the magic hand of the market, make it seem as though capitalism or colonialism are in a sense inevitable natural processes, right? That they're, they're the same thing as the landscape that they territorialize, right? They're like rain or uh, trees growing. Whereas the difficulty in these East European games in a sense challenges that remark, right? Forces you to not behave that way. The terrain in Frostbrunk is going to kill you. It's not there for you to transform into magic. The same is true of pathologic. The same is true of uh, not Disco Elysium because you can't because the terrain there works very differently. It's much more like saturated with things. But in a lot of these games, the terrain is is one kind of a hostile force. And to me, that hostility itself uh, is a important ideological lesson, right? In the sense, it it counters the idea that, uh, for example, that SimCity in a sense makes unconsciously or through procedural rhetoric that capitalism is always going to inevitably win because that's how it works, or uh, the way a civilization argues the same way that colonialism is the only way to be a civilization. In this case, it says, well, you know, your failure at building socialism means that maybe that's not, maybe it's not, another thing is historically inevitable. 
Maybe it's a matter of resisting the terrain hard enough or not hard enough or doing it right or doing it wrong. Uh, and these failures are not some sort of historical inevitability or teleology, but literally just your failures to understand the supply chain here, right? Read more guides. Um, it, it's the kind of um, a, a different understanding of history. And that's what it really teaches you, right? Like it teaches you sort of to assess in the same way as SimCity makes you think about cities and city planning in a particular way. So the city sky uh, workers and researchers make you think about the failure of communism in a different way, having played it. Right, it's, it ceases to be something that history just brought in on the winds of fate. Um, on your second question, as far as the representation of it, for this presentation, I purposefully excluded uh, Western games looking at Eastern Europe, even though I work on that quite a bit as well. Um, and there's a number of franchises that use it and they almost use it more symbolically as like this kind of weighty loaded land of suffering and moral tribulation. Um, and to me, that's kind of a set of, you know, sort of Russia as a mournful site of long bearded men uh, writing serious books kind of trope. But it's interesting to see the way East European developers um, both kind of run with this metaphor and complicated in a lot of ways. Uh, so the, the Disco Elysium is interesting for taking this elaborate world building effort of a kind of fictional post-Soviet world and really kind of saturating the details in it with meaning so that as you explore this world, everything you click on sort of unfolds into a complex narrative. Um, with Frostpunk, the whole kind of symbolism is loaded into the metaphor of wintriness, right? Which again is super associated with Eastern Europe. We just recently read a major recent memoir which described Russia as a frozen wasteland, for example. Uh, but uh, um, this kind of idea of all of Eastern Europe as this perpetual frozenness is many ways what Frostpunk plays with to frame its larger metaphor of society on the brink, of society that's not hurtling towards an utopia but is trying to stave off dystopia as desperately as it can to stave off modernist progress and territorialization. So I think that there is a, um, there is a kind of a double full move here. On the one hand, there is the Western stereotype and it is embodied. On the other hand, there is a kind of uh, deterritorialization of that Western stereotype by taking of it into new directions and directions that I think primarily uh, focus on the legacy of the Soviet, uh, Soviet dystopian utopian experiment. Um, Take in various ways. And one example from a Western game example is, is Stalker, uh, which uh, replays uh, what I've written about it before, but it replays the uh, Strugatsky by this roadside picnic in the context of Chernobyl uh, and says that Chernobyl was instead a cover up for a successful Soviet project to build a wish granting machine. Right. If you can kind of imagine that as a Western take on the same landscape, uh, even though that wasn't West, that's another East European game. Uh, there's other examples from the West that I can think of if I keep talking. Uh, but mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, let me let me try rephrasing it to make sure that I un understood. Um, uh, is might might we then um, uh, say that uh, Eastern European game developers take a particular kind of visual, etc., imaginary through what might seem like a self-orientalizing gesture, but then find ways of complicating, uh, subverting, undermining, as well as, of course, profiting. Um, from from that vision, and that this is part of the the creative play. Absolutely, I think that that is definitely a part of the kind of project here. It's that it's, um, and I think that's part of the question was was about the audience. The audience is a global audience. Um, mm -hmm. All of these games they're delivered to the same uh, online platforms that are uniformly share the American Steam and the Polish GOG, um, and I guess now the, uh, the the Chinese based Epic Store. Um, but uh, all of them are shared towards a kind of a Western, East European, and uh, uh, East Asian audience uh, in turn, and all of them kind of go through translations and uh, publications. For example, Disco Elysium is a surprise hit in China um, for its very positive discussion, which wasn't censored because of its very positive representation of communism, um, and as a result, it's become a kind of smash hit of the, of the season there um, for presenting a kind of East European vision of the post-Soviet experience, which is turning into a really interesting conversational uh, kind of a, a transcultural work. Um, but for the most part, uh, all of these games operate in all, uh, in virtually all languages. The translations of them are minimal. Often it's just a matter of translating the interface, especially with city builders like workers and resources. Um, and so they, they, they do um, address this kind of globalized stereotype, uh, the sense of Eastern Europe as in a sense marked by orientalized uh, archetypes. Um, but also plenty of room for subversion or, or kind of uh, counter narrativity or deterritorialization. Mm 
Excellent. Thank you so much. If we have more more time uh, towards the the end of our discussion, um, I would love love to keep grilling you um, and asking questions about uh, money and gender, but also questions are pouring in from the audience. So I'm going to start um, answering them live. Um, uh, so building on the question about kitchen ideal audiences, I'm curious if you see a relationship between these video games and the exploitation genre in cinema. I'm thinking of the way in which Chernobyl has been taken up as a setting in both genre cinema and video games. In both cases, it seems to me the setting is prized for its simultaneously exotic and familiar qualities, or that this admixture is an essential feature of the pleasure these media objects afford. Uh, so this is a, um, so in terms of kitsch and ideal audiences, I think that, um, I think that Chernobyl in particular is is a, a kind of interesting site and that would require talking more about Stalker, which I didn't discuss. Um, but at this point, there's actually kind of a mini subgenre of Chernobyl based games down to like truck air simulator in Chernobyl uh, and a whole bunch of other kind of mini genre Chernobyl centered uh, games. In a weird way, the post-apocalyptic is associated with the Soviet landscape uh, frequently, especially in Western games about um, uh, such as um, um, uh, Daisy, for example. Uh, and I think that um, there is a kind of link between their uh, apocalyptic and utopian qualities because a post-apocalypse is a fundamentally utopian genre. The whole point of a post-apocalypse is that all the problems that prevent us from creating utopia are now gone. Right? If you want to make an utopia, all you have to do is just get some good people, some guns, and a little stash of food, and your utopia is ready. That's the dream of every single post-apocalyptic story. And that's if you, you know, if you like zombies, movies, or series, they're always kind of foster either an utopian community that's attacked by an outside danger or a dystopian community that must be survived. I think that in general, that's um, a sort of central to the to the trope. Um, so for me, it's not about uh, utopianism, as the question goes, uh, preventing. Um, uh, um, sorry, uh, I, I, the question keeps running away from the chat. Uh, well, the, the last line was about Chernobyl and the otherness of the games, right? Um, am, I, am I correct? That's the, that's the question I'm responding to? Parody in the apocalypse. I can't say anybody's names in the chat, but uh, as far as otherness, I think that, that it's, it's actually part of the what makes them kind of familiar, right? That, that it's bringing utopianism home. Excellent. Um, I'm going to, we have so many, I'm going to pull up another one. Um, hopefully that is now displaying to you and I'll make sure not to move the chat. Uh, oh no, question. it's answered now. Thank you. I, I get it now. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, the idea that a hostile natural landscape requires a more socialist approach reminds me of the anarchists, Kropotkins, and not only resistance to Darwin, whom they accuse of seeing nature as capitalist and whom they claim misinterpreted natural evolution as competition within species rather than among species or in solidarity against nature. My question is, do you see these games teaching some sort of solidarity? My second question, I see that towered more utopia pathologic as a kind of inverted tatlin. There was a video game I found recently called Militsenir, like Prigov's Policeman and Dyadistipa. Are there a lot of references to avant-garde and conceptualist art in these games? Um, thank you so much uh, for your question. So there is, I don't wanna say that there's a more kind of, um, uh, anarchist approach uh, to nature. Um, nature here is rarely treated as a kind of um, object for, for, uh, um, for reverence or something like that, or for, for uh, equitable relationship. It's typically just overtly hostile. Um, there is, however, a kind of de-instrumentalization of nature where nature does not act nearly as a resource, uh, which is more common in games representing capitalism. Um, I would have to think about this more. This is a complicated question. Um, I, I don't want to go as far as to, as to declare it, it anarchist because um, typically they are, these games do set up sort of um, very peculiar hierarchical relationships, just part of the structure of the player having all kinds of power and agency that, that other characters in the game do not. Um, so I think it's, that's a really kind of complicated question. Um, solidarity, yeah, I do think that there is some kind of uh, solidarity training in them. Um, it's not very immediate and it doesn't operate often through the rhetoric uh, that the gamer designers want to put in. It might operate through uh, various other rhetorics the games themselves uh, put in or organized. Um, it's kind of, I kind of touched on that a little bit when discussing how um, you know, uh, ease or difficulty produce different effects or different ideological effects. But um, I, I think that, that in, at least in the case of uh, um, 
games like, uh, for example, Disco Elysium, there is a overt attempt to produce a kind of solidarity to make a kind of argument about the need for, uh, for action or for politics. Um, and in games like uh, uh, Workers and Resources, a uh, kind of structural argument for that. Um, there are direct references to the avant-garde in a lot of these games. Uh, just kind of a few examples, a Morotopia, Pathologic, uh, at some point, uh, Alexander Bork shows up with a, with a, a military battalion to burn out the town um, on day 12, uh, no, no, to no kind of accident there. Um, uh, or, or for example, an Atom RPG, which I didn't discuss, but which is the Russian fallout uh, take on the post-apocalypse if the world ended in the 1980s. Um, there are a ton of references to the avant-garde, including a character, for example, named Monoclon, who uh, gives you a kind of a, a Sorokin-esque uh, a, a blessing. Um, so it's, it's a very, it's a very self-conscious genre that works a lot of um, referential media uh, into itself, and, and, and is generally conscious of its status as a, as a, as a kind of a referential light art form. Mm, thank you so much. Here is another one. Uh, my question to Daniel has to do with the larger economy in which the distribution consumption of the games you have discussed takes place. Regardless of whether a game uh, represents a capitalist or post-socialist utopia construction, there's a certain price that a gamer needs to pay for the game, a certain kind of technology, equipment required to play it, etc. Perhaps the data collected from the players playing these games are also collected, sold, mined, etc. What kind of relationship do these post-socialist presenting games, which you have discussed, have to this larger market? Is there a difference between capitalist and post-socialist games in this respect? Um, uh, this was a question very much on my on my mind as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a um, that's a very interesting question. Um, so certainly there is a, a certain kind of a price and technology that, that comes with it. I don't think it's again unique unique to games. All, all media we consume comes with some kind of a technological prerequisite um, in order to operate with it. Uh, and but much like all digital media, video games do come with this kind of additional baggage of being uh, embroiled in complicated uh, uh, capitalist systems. Um, in games themselves, this is a kind of uh, interesting subject matter because there's a lot of different paths of funding within games. Some of them are purely traditional corporate models that we might this we might kind of imagine in other media, right? Like like all movies are made uh, by a kind of corporate model, except indie movies. Games have very similar idea. There's big studios that create big budget um, titles. Um, and then there are smaller studios that are self-funded or donation funded or not funded or put out free games or um, have various otherwise avant-garde models um, from just soliciting fan donations and support uh, to selling some sort of other objects. This ranges from uh, um, you know, uh, uh, 11-bit, which began as an indie studio, but made quite a bit of money with this war of mine uh, and therefore went to Frostpunk as a much bit more big budget project to things like Zalum, which is quite literally an anarchist collective operating out of Tallinn uh, and for whom this is the biggest, this is the only kind of real money making venture they'd ever made. Um, so their previous work was all basically performance art. Um, to uh, things like CD Projekt Red, which made the now international bestseller star hit, The Witcher mentioned in one of the questions above, uh, which are now making a game that's gonna blow up the internet in a few months, uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Um, and which also run one of the two biggest uh, distributor services that I mentioned, uh, the dominant one, of course, being Steam, and, but GOG is theirs. And even that one should kind of bear mention because it's a pretty unusual service in itself. Uh, rather than selling new games, they only sell games that can no longer be played on contemporary machines because games are often go obsolescent. Um, and so if you want to play a game from 1989, for example, um, you either go through, you can go through a kind of emulator, or if you want to buy a complete title, you go through GOG, where they'll have a, a modern playable version for it. So they have a kind of archival function. And so I think it's a complicated question. Obviously there's heavy involvement of capitalists everywhere, but I don't think it's unique to games. Uh, obvi obviously in games, there's also a bunch of counter strategies that are not as apparent in other media from anarchist collectives making games to um, sort of odd other things like, like board games, for example, and role-playing games as a largely um, Kickstarter, non-corporate run sort of outside of Hasbro phenomenon. Um, that has monoliths like Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast, but also has an enormous amount of independent, freely circulating and kind of, um, uh, you know, user-driven culture. Um, so there's a, there's a big spectrum of events. I focused on indie games in this particular project. Um, partially this is because uh, European, East European game developers are often just indie by default outside of CD Projekt Red, 
most of them are small studios that don't have the giant corporate reach of somebody like, um, uh, you know, like uh, Nintendo. Um, so, so for me, that there there is uh, definitely kind of like problems with it, uh, but there's also seemingly a lot of interesting work going on there from the developers themselves in kind of pushing back against it. Um, uh, I think you've already uh, answered one of the questions I was going to pull up next, which is focusing primarily on indie games. Um, uh, and you've already mentioned the, the Witcher series, so maybe I'll move us down. Um, and let's grab this one. Um, what is the role of player agency in enacting or reacting to territorialization in the context of video game interactivity? In the first two games you mentioned, Workers and Resources and Frostpunk, the goal and narrative thrust is production to actively construct some approximation of utopia, whereas something like Disco Elysium offers a hyper-narrativized postmodern deconstruction of the very idea of player agency and interactivity. The player is forced to react to scripted events, ideas, narratives. Despite the dissimilarities in these games' mechanics, in both cases, the idea of player agency is always illusory. In other words, what is the role of the player in a territorialization that has already been enacted by the game? Is the player complicit in a game's ideology? I think the player is definitely complicit in a game's ideology um, because to me, this is part of what I'm kind of describing with the concept of the magic circle, right? That, that games draw you into this mini utopia where, where nothing is at stake, but everything is at stake um, and allow you to um, explore the limits of personal freedom in a way that fundamentally shuts down any possibility of personal freedom. Uh, the avant-garde game Stanley Parable uh, is pretty famous for arguing that you'll never be free and the only way you're gonna be free is by turning off the game and, and stop trying to look for freedom in it. I, and I'm kind of, I feel that that um, that's, uh, strongly influences my thinking here as well. Um, player agency is by design illusory, but what's interesting in games is that they're, since a medium constantly promising player agency. Um, and then constantly failing to deliver it and nobody stops playing them as a result, which is again, to me, an interesting paradox. The way I kind of resolve it for myself is through the issue of identity, because it seems to me that what really changes in the magic circle um, is in some ways you, um, and, and that's the kind of biggest threat or question with games and one that games inherited from, from literature, which caused similar moral panics is that sense sort of what's happening when you, when you play a game. Like are you, when you play workers and resources and get it really good, do you become a communist, right? When you play, uh, uh, when you play uh, SimCity too much, you become a capitalist, right? These kinds of um, questions of how games produce ideology or kinds of uh, uh, knowledge and power they exercise in the course of producing their weird epistemologies, uh, because we can all agree they have epistemologies, we can all agree they're fraudulent, but they're really compelling. So what exactly kind of changes they're producing is always a big question. And so um, for me, it's sort of that games will never produce agency. They can't in some ways. Um, they can produce limited agency. They can produce agency within certain kind of a, a diapason of possibility. Um, many people discuss sandbox games, which as they get more and more complicated, uh, become more and more agency rich. And certainly we should discuss role-playing games, which to me are the kind of the, the true vector of development with which games are heading, where um, agency becomes much, much more real because it is sort of a, it becomes a kind of social, nego socially negotiated improvised uh, construct which is only uh, loosely restricted by the actual game. Um, so I think that, that uh, it's a question that can't be answered in some ways, but I think that the question of, uh, of um, as you say, uh, kind of a com uh, complicit, complicitness is exactly how to, how to best approach it. That, that is exactly what games are. They, they make you complicit with your own unfreedom, uh, promise you freedom, fail to deliver it, and ask you to keep playing in order to become more free potentially. And I talk, you know, for me, this is a big, bigger issue and I can keep going on this forever. There's also a lot of practices in contemporary games that kind of break the limit of the game, whether by modding it, changing it, hacking it, speed running it, uh, playing it against the grain. You know, it's like practices like the one I just described in Frostpunk where you refuse to research anything and just keep your, keep your dystopia at the level that the frost causes rather than your society causes. Um, the kind of self-imposed difficulty, but a difficulty you could choose nonetheless. Uh, I'm going to jump in here. Um, I think we have time for one last question. And in fact, I think I'm going to take part of an audience question. Um, uh, so talking about the, the moral frameworks that go into game design, and I'm skipping to the very last bit of this, this question on the screen. 
Uh, though not a utopian game, The Witcher, of course, normalizes a certain kind of conduct around sex. To what extent do you think game designers inadvertently normalize a certain kind of morality regardless, gender, imperialist, etc., when designing these utopia building exercises? I think it's a great question. It's, it's really central to my own research, at least with The Witcher, I, I discuss, uh, I use The Witcher to structure both discussion on, on gender representation and race representation uh, in my classes. Um, because you're absolutely right. I mean, the procedural rhetoric in games like The Witcher or like basically most games is one that I described, one that, that naturalizes territorialization as a general process where you're always conquering time, space, uh, other bodies, other people's uh, sex, and that conquest is the game. You're playing it to get better at playing it. You're pl territorializing to get better at territorializing. Um, this problem and how to use it has been a continuous one uh, throughout the history of games in the last two, 300 years. We've seen attempts to just take games and uh, kind of invest them with a new meaning. For example, uh, Suffragetto, then 19, 1909 uh, uh, WPSU uh, game uh, for a teaching street combat tactic against the police for young suffragettes. It's a great example of taking a war game and using it as a, a tactical training for, uh, for radical conflict with the police. Or uh, McGee's uh, Landlord's Game, which after being stolen by Daryl became Monopoly, which tried to teach you uh, the uh, the concept that all property should be communal, right? All these kinds of uh, right right out of Comincio of Georgism. Um, so these attempts to you know use territorialization to teach you to to put a stop to territorialization forever, um, or to teach you to use games to put a stop to uh, the kind of odious process that they describe, they're really fascinating to me and a big part of my project. Uh, what interests me in these contemporary games is that um, they no longer quite believe that the way this can be achieved is just by kind of mapping in a correct rhetorical appeal. Um, and in some ways, The Witcher is a highlight of that, right? The Witcher's problems with gender representation are uh, notoriously bad and notoriously uh, have got, quote unquote gotten better, right? Because in the first Witcher, every woman you met came with a playing card, a collectible playing card that became nude when you slept with her. Um, literally every female character in the game came with this collectible playing card. Uh, by the third Witcher, we have like developed romantic relationships culminated with a sex scene reward, right? So. Is that progress or is that just the same thing, but with a kind of comp more complicated rhetoric? Um, to me, games that like, for example, uh, completely refuse that level of rhetoric and put you in the position of a kind of collapsing alcoholic subjectivity that is not a romantic hero like in Disco Elysium, uh, but is rather a kind of metaphor for, uh, for an age desirous to forget itself and it has forgotten itself. Um, to me, that's, that's closer to the kind of role of uh, traditional literature than maybe what I want to talk about with games here, but it still suggests different rooms for subjectivity or different kind of approaches to remapping the subjectivity, even if it does put you in the position of a, of a, a male protagonist. And uh, Zaum apparently wanted to develop an expansion for the game where you played a pregnant woman, framing the game very differently from a very different vantage point, and I think they might be working on it right now. Um, but to me, the real kind of meat of the critique happens not in the kind of rhetorical content, but in procedural rhetorics, like the kind of structures the game emphasizes or doesn't emphasize, uh, the kind of economics it represents, doesn't represents, uh, the difficulties it engages, um, because those uh, force a kind of accounting from the player that's not simply a matter of getting a message or not getting a message. They, they allow a more nuanced position on what, in a sense, happened, what was represented, and what is being uh, represented to you. Um, I don't know if that kind of answers the question fully. I think it's a remarkable uh, place to end on. Thank you so much for uh, your really interesting talk, for introducing us to this material. Um, also, this idea of the Zaum uh, coming out of an anarchist collective that does performance art and writing a game uh, from the perspective of a pregnant woman. I know I'm going to be um, looking for that, um, watching for for their uh, their productions uh, in the in the months to come. Um, but thank you so much again for the talk, also for your extremely gracious, sharp, um, and quick responses in this Q&A. I know we've riddled and peppered you um, with so many. Um, uh, great big thank you to the audience for joining us. Please continue to join us. This event is recorded and will be made available um, on, the, on YouTube. Um, uh, and we will be posting more information about the next next events in our speaker series. Again, great big thank you to my fellow organizers, to Reese McMillan Center and European Studies. And once again, Daniel, thank you so much for your thought, your provocative talk. <laughs>
and we can't wait to see what you do with it in the future. Thank you so much, Marietta. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Round of applause and everybody um, over, over and out and to all good night.